Good, after Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to our honored guests, friends, colleagues, and students. My name is Nancy Adler, Program Director of Genocide Studies at the Niyot Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies. And it is my privilege to introduce our esteemed speaker today. On the occasion of this 14th annual lecture in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, we are greatly honored that Professor Norman Nymark, whom I will properly introduce in just a moment, kindly accepted our invitation to speak. But first, allow me to share a few words on the NEOD Genocide Studies program. Our task is fourfold. University education, research, outreach activities, such as public lectures with preeminent speakers like our guest today, and education. In our 14 years of existence, we have developed an internationally reputable MA program at the University of Amsterdam with dozens of graduates, many of whom have continued on in the field, in NGOs across the globe or as doctoral candidates and university faculty, among others. In 2003, our first class had three students. This year, we had 80 applicants for 25 spots. For many years now, our incoming classes have reached or exceeded our capacity. Our students have conducted field work, uh, including oral histories and archival research in Australia, Bosnia, Cambodia, Canada, Ecuador, Iraq, Israel, Poland, Russia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Turkey, and in the archives and courtrooms of several international tribunals. Further, one of our PhD candidates is about to defend his dissertation on transitional justice, mass atrocity trials, and history in Africa. And we have a new PhD researcher in collaboration with the university. She will spend the next four years investigating two killing grounds in Belarus, one holding the remains of victims of Nazism, the other victims of Stalinism. My colleagues and I are very proud to advise these doctoral candidates and our students. And I would like to take this opportunity to extend a special warm welcome to this year's incoming class. We are looking forward to an inspiring year together. In addition to our regular teaching, the NEOD faculty has also participated in various summer school programs in and outside the Netherlands. Our research has also not stood still. Currently, projects are being completed on subjects that range from new investigation of the Baba Yar massacre in Ukraine, to perpetrator testimonies in international criminal tribunals, to competing narratives on the Stalinist past. A number of publications on these themes will emerge next year. And on the educational front, we continue to carry out activities aimed at arming a younger audience with an understanding of the Holocaust and other genocides. To this end, we have reinforced our cooperation with the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation in order to teach the teachers to work with their unprecedented eyewitness collection of testimonies. Additionally, our Holocaust Memorial Day program organized and hosted a number of activities that directly involved the younger generation, sometimes in conversation with survivors. This year's activity uh, included the Never Again Auschwitz lecture by Timothy Snyder. As for today's event, each year this annual lecture focuses on one of the key themes in the fields of Holocaust and genocide studies. Last year, James Young, an expert in the field of Holocaust and memory studies, reflected on his experiences as advisor and juror for many of the contemporary memorials to catastrophe including Germany's memorial. This year, we are greatly privileged to host a pioneer in Russian and East European studies and genocide studies. Norman Nymark currently holds the Robert and Florence McDonald Chair in East European History at Stanford University. He is the recipient of numerous international awards, has served on the editorial boards of leading journals, and has been president, chair, or board member of all of the major professional associations related to his field. He has also written several authoritative books, including The Fires of Hatred, a comparative study of ethnic cleansing and genocide in 20th century Europe, The Russians in Germany, 
focusing on the Soviet occupation in Germany, Stalin's genocides, and most recently, Genocide, a World History. In this book, which I, I expect will become a standard work, Professor Nymark traces genocide from ancient times until today and shows how the character of genocide has maintained many similarities across time. Allow me to share with you his eloquent, concise argument in support of this grim reality. Quote, armies of men kill identifiable groups of human beings, including women, children, and non-combatants at the command of their pol political leaders who often invoke ideologies, gods, and God in their arguments for destruction. The killing is intentional, total, and eliminationist." Unquote. With this brief introduction, I hope to have elucidated on why we are so fortunate to have Norman Nymark with us today to share his reflections on the meaning of genocide. When, Professors Nymark, when Professor Nymark's lecture is finished, there will be an opportunity for the audience to pose questions. The formal part of the day will be followed by a reception in the Senatskammer in the back here, to which we warmly welcome all of you. So without further ado, it is my great honor to invite Professor Nymark to take the stage. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, the next 45 minutes or so, uh, I want to talk about, can you all hear me okay? I, I couldn't stand up there. It was too much for me. I would, I would feel like one of those, who mentioned the Lutheran preachers from the whatever century were up there, and I don't want to be a Lutheran preacher. Uh, from several centuries ago. So I hope you don't mind if we do this more informally, uh, congregationalist style or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about this new book, uh, which is, uh, came out in January. Um, uh, it's called Genocide, a World History. Uh, it's a relatively short book because uh, Oxford made me make it short, um, sort of like a lecture um, Nancy has said, you know, 45 minutes, no more. Yeah, actually, she gave me a little bit of, of leeway, so I will stop uh, in 45 minutes. Let me just take a look at my watch to make sure I know where I am. Okay, I think we got it, right? So before 420, all right. Um, uh, I want to talk about the book in two parts. Uh, the first part, you know, is sort of conceptually, as it were, uh, about what, what I'm trying to do in the book and what it, what it means. And then the second part is really the themes that repeat themselves uh, in the book and that come up uh, over time. So it's really a kind of two-part lecture, a couple words of, uh, two couple words of conclusion. Okay, uh, conceptual part. Now, obviously, um, this is a world history of genocide, meaning uh, uh, looking at genocide from the very beginning of human history uh, to the present. And that in and of itself is a kind of concept in some ways. Uh, and it's an argument uh, that has to be defended. There are a lot of people, in fact, I was one of them, who believed that genocide was a 20th century um, uh, affair that belonged to the 20th century, that you needed modernity, that you needed, you know, totalitarian uh, 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 countries, that you needed um, modernization for there to be genocide. And as um, I came to discover at many talks like this, with people raising their hands and asking me about the past, uh, the distant past, you know, was this genocide, was that genocide, I would often say, well, no, it has to be modern. And I think that's part of the hubris, really, of 20th century historians. And there is a hubris of 20th century historians who believe that anything worth knowing or doing happened, you know, uh, uh, in the modern period. Uh, you know, maybe since the French Revolution, but at least since the First World War. And, and as I went back in time and looked further uh, behind uh, um, what was going on, 
uh, in distant times, I came to the conclusion that's simply not the case. Um, and that genocide is part and parcel, integral to everything we know in human history. Uh, and I say human history, how far back do you go? It's hard to say. You know, there is studies of prehistoric um, mass graves where people will say, you know, that massacres were committed here, but they don't know, obviously, whether it was genocide or not. They don't know if whole peoples were eliminated or that sort of thing. So, you know, I tend to start this book off uh, with the Old Testament, and maybe it is appropriate uh, in this place to talk a little bit about the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament was something I didn't really read when I was a young man, and I probably uh, should have more. And if I'd read it more carefully, I would have been more horrified. I mean, if you read the Old Testament, right, and you read Deuteronomy, and you read stories, you know, from uh, uh, the Bible, um, they are really terrifying stories in the Bible, in the Old Testament, among the Hebrews, of mass murder. So, you know, maybe, I don't know if you do this in, in Holland or not, but when I was a boy, we used to sing, you know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You know, this old spirituals. And in that, they never say, you know, when you sing that uh, uh, spiritual about the walls coming tumbling down, that God also commanded Joshua to kill all the men, women, and children in Jericho and to burn the city to the ground. In other words, it's an example of mass murder. Now, we don't know, obviously, what happened uh, at Jericho. People have done a lot of archaeological uh, work at Jericho to try to figure out exactly uh, what happened. But um, we... we we don't know, and the Old Testament stories are just that, stories. We can't say that genocide actually happened, but we can say, you know, that those who wrote, those, you know, scholars and, um, and rabbis who wrote the Old Testament in the 6th and 5th century B.C. knew something about the mass killing of people. And then you carry genocide forward in time you know, from the Bible to the Greeks to the Romans, you know, all the way up to our own time and all the way up to our own day, you know, when clearly things are going on or have gone on in Syria, um, perhaps in Myanmar, we don't know, that resemble, you know, the mass murder of entire uh, peoples. So genocide is a world history. It belongs to our entire history of civilization or civilizations may be better put. None is exempt from it. Uh, and everyone, everyone's traditions are wrapped up uh, in genocide. Okay. A couple other things to say about this. First of all, um, I believe that genocide can be historicized. And what I mean by that is these are not odd episodes that we pick out from the past, you know, idiosyncratic episodes here and there around the past, but they're linked with one another. And we find these linkages, actually, if you look for them. And those linkages are pretty clear. So there is such a thing as a history of genocide, right? Not just as a bunch of separate episodes, but as linked episodes, you have to be careful, you know, not to overdo it. Um, and you have to be careful not to overdo the causational aspects of it. But nevertheless, you know, we know, for example, that the Spanish, you know, in the 16th century, when they took over, you know, the New World, had read the Old Testament and cited the Old Testament. They knew about Carthage and the destruction of Carthage. And they cited the destruction of Carthage uh, in their work. Later on, people cited the Spanish. You know, when colonial powers went into various parts of the world and destroyed native indigenous peoples, I mean, frequently, they would say, look, this is what the Spanish did in the New World, and actually cite some basic sources uh, about uh, what the Spanish had done. And we take this all the way up into the 20th century, I mean, we know Hitler said, you know, before he invaded Poland, who remembers the Armenians now? 
or we think he said it. I mean, there's a lot of historiographical argument. Historians wouldn't be historians if they didn't argue, right? But there's a lot of argument whether he really said it or not, but it's pretty clear that Hitler knew exactly what happened to the Armenians. And he was saying to his generals, don't worry when you march into Poland. He's talking, by the way, about killing Poles as well as Jews. Don't worry. Nobody's going to pay any attention. And if they do, it'll be short-lived and they'll forget it. So genocides relate to one another. Now, we know that Stalin's watching Hitler and Hitler's watching Stalin. And they're both watching the, those killings. And they're both saying to, about each other, you know, in Russian maladets, you know, good boy. And so, and, 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 and so the, the history, in other words, of genocide can be constructed in relation to the episodes that occur uh, over time. The other thing to say uh, about this is, and this is something, you know, um, I've discovered in some sense to my deep regret, and it's not discovery, if you thought about it, you'd know it, you never know all the cases of genocide. There are a couple of reasons for this. Well, first of all, we simply don't have the capacity as individuals, as historians, to be able to even absorb those cases of genocide which have been chronicled and documented and written about. I mean, in this audience, there are clearly people who will raise their hand and could say to me, well, what about this case? And I'm going to say, I haven't heard the thing about that. You know, it's just one of those things. You know, that cases exist that we all know about, some of them, like the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, the Rwandan Genocide, and, all, and so on, you know, that uh, we all know about. But there are many that we don't. And as I got into this work, I realized what you always realize as an historian is how much you don't know and how much there is out there that you don't know. I mean, I ran into this in particular reading, I think this New Yorker about two years ago, there was an article called The Last Selknam Speaker. Now, who were the Selknam? I had no idea. This was a, a linguist, a journalist linguist, who had interviewed the last speaker of the Selknam language. How many people know who the Selknam are? Well, you're like everybody else, right? Uh, they were a people, according to this um, uh, uh, scholar, of uncertain nomadic origins who lived in Tierra del Fuego in the very southern part of Chile, who in the 1880s and 1890s uh, were set upon in a very typical um, uh, pattern uh, of what we call ge uh, settler genocide. And in that pattern of settler genocide, you know, uh, ranchers on the one hand and gold miners, on the other hand, they had found gold uh, in uh, Tierra del Fuego, uh, decided that the land should be theirs uh, and not the Selknam. Uh, the Selknam resisted, uh, and the result was their elimination. And there's one Selknam speaker left, right, who was interviewed in this article. This pattern repeats itself thousands of times, and we don't know. And we'll never know. And of course, as you go back into history, it becomes even more difficult to know all of the cases of genocide that occurred because people disappear and they're gone. I, um, a, a, a wonderful colleague uh, at UCLA, a young man named Benjamin Madley, who I've known for a long time, just published a very fine book about California, uh, uh, Calif the genocide of California Indians. We knew something about, I mean, I've been a Californian 90% of my life, which is a long time. Um, and, you know, we knew something about the killing of, uh, of California Indian tribes. And in my book, I talk about one tribe. I found it easier, by the way, instead of talking about the killing of California Indians, just to pick out a tribe. And similarly with um, Aborigines in Australia, instead of talking about all Aborigines, to talk about the Tasmanian. Aborigines, and you know, using these cases so that you can get deeper into them. It's, it's too general and too difficult to talk about all the cases. But what Madley did, 
and it's never been done before. And my hope is that his book will be on the desk of every Californian high school student so that they know is to document the scores of elimination of Indian tribes in California. You know, partly as a result of the gold rush uh, uh, in 1849 and the coming into the United States of California statehood um, in 1850. In the 1860s and 70s, 90% of the Indians in California were wiped out. And we're talking more than 200,000 people just wiped out for their land. But each of those cases that you don't know about and that I don't know about are cases of genocide. And it's not just California. Imagine Siberia or parts of Africa that we know less about or South America and so on. So my point being is we'll never know all the cases of genocide. Let me say, you know, spend a few minutes on definition before we move on. You know, everybody has to deal with definition. It's a very difficult issue, and you can write a lot about definition, and people have written a lot about how you define genocide. I approach this in a very pragmatic way, in part because I didn't want to spend my time, and I didn't have a lot of pages in this book. <laughs> I was limited. Uh, uh, you know, a very pragmatic definition of genocide which relates to the work of Raphael Lemkin. Many of you know that name, the great hero of the genocide story who developed the concept of genocide, coined the term um, uh, in his famous book about Axis rule in Europe uh, in 1944, and then helped influence the UN past the Genocide Convention in December 1948. And that definition basically said, let me just, that's the one thing I'll read. Genocide. Are acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part, again, you don't have to destroy a whole people, right? Or in part, a national, ethnical, terrible word, we would say ethnic today, racial or religious group, comma, as such, period, end of quote. Right? So your intent is crucial. It's the intention to murder or kill off part or all of a group with the idea of aiming at that group as a whole. That's the comma as such part. So it's a group as a group you're trying to destroy. So a massacre is not genocide. It can be part of genocide, but it's not necessarily genocide. Right? Ethnic cleansing could be genocide. It's not necessarily genocide. Genocide is the idea of destroying a group um, uh, as such, as a group. Now, the one thing that I add to that definition that I need to mention as part of the description of the concept behind the book is the one thing I don't like about that definition is the fact that it doesn't include other kinds of groups, meaning social groups in particular or political groups. So, for example, uh, you know, the killing of the Germans killed the handicapped. And were only stopped, as you know, uh, when there was some protest among the German population. Otherwise, they would have killed all the handicapped population. We're talking several hundred thousand people, right? 250,000 people. It would have killed them all and came close. Right? That's a group. I consider that genocide. Under the Genocide Convention, it's not. Right? And it links up with the other killing that Hitler did too, with the Jews, with the gypsies. Right? It links together with that. So to separate it out, say that's not genocide, I think doesn't make any sense to me. Um, another, uh, you know, uh, a troublesome uh, uh, a point having to do with the definition is the Cambodian genocide. I mean, we call it a Cambodian genocide, right? But if you kill Cambodians, it's not genocide. And you may know from the courts that are meeting, still meeting in Cambodia, um, you know, from these special hybrid courts, uh, they have actually said, no, you know, uh, um, this character who was the um, commandant uh, of the Tulsang 
uh, a prison where 16,000 people were tortured and murdered. Initially was convicted of genocide that was overthrown because they said he killed Cambodians. Now, in Cambodia, they also killed some Vietnamese, Han people, and Buddhists as Buddhists. And some of that is considered genocide. But generally, what we call the Cambodian genocide has not been determined to be the Cambodian genocide, right? And people have been, have been um, let go of that conviction because of that piece of the legislation that says you don't kill your own people, you kill other people. Right? And I just find that irrational, and, and um, I don't think it works well historically either. Um, and uh, as, you'll, uh, as you'll see, I mean, I talk in this book, or maybe you won't see, but I talk in this book about communist genocide and about anti-communist genocide. You know, the Indonesian, case of Indonesia. Um, in 65, 66, where, you know, we don't know exactly, but certainly more than a half a million Indonesian communists were rounded up and slaughtered as a group, right? Identified as communists or alleged communists, taken out and killed mostly by the Indonesian military. Right? I consider that genocide. If you go back to the making of the convention uh, in 1947 and 48, you see also that the Soviets worked very hard in committee, in the Sixth Committee, the Judicial Committee, to make sure that social and political groups were dropped from the Genocide Convention. Initially, the General Assembly in 1946 had included them in the concept of genocide. So, you know, the, the political making of the Genocide Convention in some ways we're still, uh, we're still uh, paying for. Okay, let's move to themes. There are a number of them, we won't get through them all. But let me just uh, talk about a few repetitive themes that go throughout this story. And remember, uh, I mean, what I should have said is that what I've done in the book, and I think the way we should think about this, this large history, this meta-history of genocide, as it were, is in periods. I mean, historians do this all the time. They love periodization, and I think for good reason. I mean, periods of history, you know, are not completely homogeneous. You know, they're not completely separated from prior or, 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 or um, subsequent periods but they do make some sense. So the periods I use in this book, by the way, I divide it into ancient genocides, I talk about warrior genocides, I talk about the Spanish uh, in the New World, because I think that's a crucial, uh, a crucial piece of this story that I'll talk about uh, in a second. Uh, I talk about modern genocides, I talk about uh, uh, post-Cold War genocides, I talk about settler genocides, you know, which is a, a category of genocides, and each of those has certain commonalities that are different from the others. But there are more similarities than there are differences. And you look, again, go all the way, go read Deuteronomy. I recommend it to you if you're a student of genocide. And it really, as my students would say, blows your mind, you know, because it's, it's like what we know you know, from the Armenian Genocide or from the Holocaust or others, you know? God is ordering his representatives to murder peoples, all of them. Okay, so in those periods then, they're all different, they're all uh, uh, separate. I wanted to make sure uh, uh, to mention that. All right, uh, so the various themes. First of all, this theme of war and genocide. I mean, these are mostly obvious. I think if you would think about them, you would come up with them yourself. I mean, genocide frequently takes place, not always, but frequently takes place during war. You know, if there's no other reason to avoid war, the fact that genocide is so closely linked to war and to civil war uh, is one of them. So if you come, you know, move your way through history. You know, the famous Melian dialogue with